You're listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, a podcast dedicated to the private lending industry. I'm Kevin Kim, and my goal is to sit down with key figures in the private lending industry to talk about their business and their personal lives. We'll get their takes on market conditions, the industry at large, and their personal stories. Overall, I really want to learn more about how they started and grew their businesses. So whether you're a lender, a borrower, a vendor, an investor, or anyone just interested in learning more about private lending, this podcast is definitely for you. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this week's episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Wow, over 40 years of experience? 40 years is a long time for any line of business, but for appraisal management, that's unheard of. But that's the incredible thing about PCV Mercor. They've been managing appraisals and valuation since 1981. While PCV Mercor's processes and technologies have evolved over the past 40 years, their focus on excellent customer service remains the same to develop and maintain strong engagement and collaboration with their clients. If you want to experience the best service in the appraisal management industry, PCV Mercor is the AMC to align your business and trust with. Learn more at pcvmercor.com. Hey guys, Kevin Kim here for another episode of Lender Lounge with yours truly, Kevin Kim. This time we are on Zoom uh, we, because we have our friends from Western Alliance Bank. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, but you all know them. We've, we we hang out with them all the time at industry events. If you don't know them, get to know them. But let's let's start with uh, Lisa. Please introduce yourself for the audience, and we'll go we'll to Mark next. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having us. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Lisa Alberti. I'm a senior vice president uh, with the Note Finance team uh, at Western Alliance Bank. Uh, I've been with the bank about seven years. Uh, three years with the note finance team. Um, and before that, I was part of uh, the commercial real estate lending division uh, in downtown LA. Um, so yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Mark? Great. Uh, uh, yes, thank you for having us today. Uh, a big pleasure. And I've been, uh, uh, name is Mark Roberts, uh, senior vice president as well at Western Alliance Bank uh, in the note financing department. Uh, I in this uh, senior relationship manager for most of the East Coast and Texas, uh, and Lisa covers most of the West Coast. Um, so we, uh, I go back to, what twelve years with Western Alliance Bank, joined the note financing team in two thousand seventeen, and uh, you know um, Lisa and I go back. We were just talking about some fifteen years. So uh, she she actually called on. Uh, my boss, Steve Curley, and our bank when we were at another bank, and that's how we got to know her. And then that uh, that uh, relationship just uh, flowed along to uh, right. to where we are now. Fantastic. I mean, so for the audience who are not familiar with Western Alliance Bank and uh, Lisa and Mark, you know, Western Alliance and you guys, have, we, we, we work together, we share a ton of clients, and, you know, I consider you guys friends. What's more important than all of that fun stuff is that the role you guys have played in the marketplace in the past, I would say, five-ish years now has been, you know, amazing. You guys have come to the, you guys came to the market and offered and built out, but offered a very well-respected and well-received uh, warehouse line product for the private lending industry. And you know, as a former banker myself. <laughs> I know that that is not the easiest product to not only navigate and 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 underwrite and structure, but also it's an in, the industry itself is not easy to translate. Right, it's not easy to translate as a banker. Um, let's talk about a little bit about your guys' history. Like you know, it, when it comes to this stuff, were you guys both? doing this I mean, what was your what were what your backgrounds when it comes to banking and finance and, and lending in general because you know i like you lisa when i first started at a bank i was basically a commercial real estate loan officer i just did you know strip strip mall and gas station loans basically and like you know when i heard about this industry it was like what it didn't make any <laughs> sense to me right so i mean what's up with lisa like tell me a little bit more about your background you know where you come from on, on the banking side and what you maybe if you did anything before that yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I actually started my career um, in SBA lending. So I did owner-occupied commercial real estate loans. Um, oh, man. Yeah, it was, it, I enjoyed it. it. It was fun working with entrepreneurs, and it's, it's basically how I 
got to learn commercial real estate. Yeah. Um, and I would say it was about seven or eight years ago. I decided I kind of felt like a one trick pony. All I knew was SBA and I wanted to learn other types of commercial real estate lending. And that's when I joined Tory Pines Bank wow. and um, uh, was really focused more on investor commercial real estate and, and did some owner occupied as well. Um, and also learned a little bit about CNI lending. And then um, it was about three years ago that Mark Roberts kind of called me out of the blue and said, hey, we're looking for somebody in California uh, on the note finance team. Um, and uh, I jumped at the opportunity, you know, the, the bank. And we can maybe uh, in a minute talk a little bit about Western Alliance Bank and who we are. Uh, but we've had tremendous growth with our national business lines. And note finance team is one of those um, specialty divisions. So when this opportunity presented itself, I, I jumped at it. Um, and it's it's been great the past three years. So that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big transition, right? So because you're doing commercial real estate, you're doing you're doing your average commercial like bread and butter for the bank, right? I'm guessing yep. SBA five hundred four, right? Yep, exactly. Yep, I know it. Yeah, I mean, I used to do the same thing, right? So you're used to getting every single piece of collateral. You're used to getting really, you know, tight packaged transactions. And then, I mean, look, I mean, the bank is it, it probably has very tight packaging on the warehouse lines themselves, but your counterparties, right? I mean, I can't, first of all, I can't even believe it's been three years. It's only been three years, that's crazy. But that, it's a big change. Different type of, different type of uh, borrower, if you will, right? It, it, it is, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still real estate. And that's, right. that's I think, what Mark and I enjoy about, about this division is we get to look at all kinds of real estate all mm -hmm. over the country. So we're so looking at- to commercial and residential, right? Exactly. Yeah. Fixed and flip to commercial, to ground up construction, office, multifamily, every product type and every market in the country. Right. And so we still get to use our, you know, commercial real estate lending fundamentals. Right. Um, but in this very, very unique um, uh, lending scenario. Okay. So it's a good mix of both worlds. Right. Well, Mark, how about you? Give me a little bit of background yeah. on, on Mark. You know, were you always doing this? You see, you've been with the team for a little while now, so. Yeah, uh, the, the team and the bank. Um, but, you know, if you go far enough back, uh, construction and this type of uh, business isn't new to me. I was actually a licensed mechanical contractor and boiler installer uh, growing up for a, in a family business. So uh, I have a contractor background, and then uh, ultimately that led uh, into banking, or I found my way into banking and uh, did a little bit of a stint in the CMBS world. And uh, when uh, 2007, 8, 9 hit, that, that industry kind of went sideways. And mm -hmm. I ended up, that's where I ended up with uh, uh, a, a different bank that uh, where I met uh, Lisa at. And then we uh, from there, uh, transitioned over to Western Alliance Bank. So I've been in banking for a while. I think the um, the key with what Lisa and I do and is unique is it is very much real estate focused, but there's also, when, when she mentioned C&I lending, um, that's consumer and industrial, which is, uh, is, is really business banking. And um, there's an asset-based lending component to that, which really means you're just it's like um, you're monitoring short-term turns of collateral. And so there's the the skill set that comes in handy is that background that Lisa had and I had in traditional business banking and in real estate banking that uh, that, that ties those two together and um, you know makes it for a lot uh, easier to understand what we do. Well, I want to ask you about this. So you, how did you transition from that to banking though? That's a, that's a big difference, a big difference. Yeah, so uh, so it's a, a good question. Um, I actually uh, got into the HVAC business. It was a family business. My dad had a stroke, so I dropped out of college uh, and kept that family business going for a while till he recovered and ultimately passed away. And then uh, and then I had had a degree in banking, finance, economics, and uh, and then um, found my way into find found a it wasn't a business I wanted to stay with, and found mm -hmm. my way into banking. Um, a guy took a risk on me and hired me, and uh, the rest is history. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. And, I, and one of the things that I love about, you know, how people end up in banking, it's always never, it's never, you know, I plan to work at a bank. <laughs> no one ever plans to work at a bank, right? Like I had, I had a legal studies degree from, from college and like, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't, I didn't know what, what I wanted to do. I didn't, know, I didn't think about law school. And my father was a banker who I thought was trying to try to talk me out of it was like, 
Kevin, if you want to learn how the world works, you got to learn how money works, go work for a bank. And it was one of the best experiences I've had. I used everything I've learned. I used so much of what I've learned there today. And I mean, it makes sense. I'm working for a bunch of lenders anyway, right? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the bank. Let's talk about Western Alliance Bank because Western Alliance has grown immensely over the past few years. Um, you know, when I started working with you guys, I had already known about Tory for many, many years. And I would not know that Tory was owned by Western Alliance Bank. It's one of the subsidiary banks. And Western Alliance is the holding company over it. And so, you know, talk about the bank. You know, it's now, I, I, is it still considered a regional bank? I mean, you guys are pretty much national now. Um, yeah. And talk about kind of what, what, it's, what it's all about and what it's focusing on and what, what, what its, what it's uh, strong points are. So Western Alliance is a, about a $65 billion bank. We're publicly traded, um, headquartered out of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and as you mentioned, Kevin, we have some um, uh, subsidiary banks or sister banks um, located throughout California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, so it's Torrey Pines Bank in Southern California, Alliance Bank of Arizona and Arizona, um, Bank of Nevada and Las Vegas, Bridge Bank in Northern California, and First Independent Bank out of Reno. Mm. Um, and as you mentioned, we've grown tremendously. Um, and a lot of that growth, as I mentioned, has been through the national business lines, um, which we have, I believe it's up to 17 now, 17 very specialized business lines right. um, that are industry specific. So it includes note finance, it includes, gosh, Mark, what resort finance, HOA, equipment leasing. Um, gaming, uh, media and entertainment, international trade, private equity in BC. Wow. Uh, yeah. What, um, what we do, the mortgage warehouse line and note finance, we have, we, we actually acquired GE Capital's uh, hotel uh, franchise finance division and brought over their team. So we were one of the bigger uh, hotel uh, lenders in the country. And, um, you know, we have a gaming division too out of Nevada. So, um, Very cool. you know, we're pretty, pretty entrepreneurial. And, and what's what I've, I guess I've I've interacted with bankers my entire life. I mean, I'm the son of a banker. My grandfather was. A, I'm a third generation banker, so I know bankers, right? So, <laughs> uh, and I have a lot of friends who are still bankers. And um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed with Western Alliance is, at least my interaction with you guys and your team members, has been, you guys kind of strike a nice balance between entrepreneurial, but also. There's certain things and discipline, right? There's a, there's a level of institutional uh, uh, feel to you guys, and there's a level of uh, what I would consider discipline in operations, balanced with a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. Because I mean, like for example, for our audience, like you know, Lisa and I, we plan we plan you know industry dinners and client relations dinners and stuff like that all the time. But at the same time, when we talk shop, you guys have oftentimes say, no, that's that's a, a bridge too far. Here are the reasons why. And what that contrasting that, I mean, for a long time in our industry, especially in our industry, in private lending, we had a lot of banks who were a little bit more too, too, too entrepreneurial and a lot of problems that came from that. Right. And so, you know, we had a lot of um, uh, well, I would consider kind of a. a uh, retrading or bait and switch issues that changed from my perspective, at least when you guys came to town almost immediately. And I remember very early on when it was, it was like Mark and our friend Seth and we would, I, I would be very surprised. Like I would get, to, I would see term sheets that were not just like printed out after a phone call and they were very, very well thought out. And the clients were, the client's response was always, you know, they're 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 not tough, but they're they're going to make you work for it because it's it's an important project. And when we're finished, and when we're after they're finished, they're very happy about it. Like this is a great bank to work with. We share a bunch of clients who have now have several hundred million dollars with you guys, and they consider you guys partners, right? So talk about that balancing act because when you're a banker, right, you, you kind of have to operate within a certain mandate, you, you, typically. I and mean, most banks that I've worked at, it's a very set box you have to operate in. How do you guys, how does Western Alliance and you guys craft the, that balancing act of entrepreneurialism with kind of discipline and 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 being kind of more institutional in your approach? 
Sure. And maybe let's take a step back and we can talk about how this group came to fruition That's and how, that, yeah. yeah, how management at the bank um, uh, decided to create this division. And so basically, you know, we're a bank within the bank is what we like to tell our customers. Right. So our team, um, can, what do we mark about 35, 40 people right. in yep. total? <clears throat> the majority yes. of our staff sits in Phoenix. Um, and so our what management did was they they took a look at the industry and they determined, you know, there was banks, um, this was seven, eight years ago, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, there was community banks and regional banks that played in this space for credit facilities up to say 15 or 20 million. Right. And then you've got the the big money center banks, the Wall Street banks that, as we like to say, don't get out of bed for anything under a hundred million. Right. So there is this underserved market between 20 to 100 million that, that I think the group really focused on when it was started about seven or eight years ago. And what management did was they created, um, like I said, a bank within the bank where we have our own credit team, we have our own collateral team, we have our own operations team, we have our own treasury management team. And it's critical because every member of our team understands our private lenders and their day-to-day business. Mm-hmm. So uh, our credit facilities are not one size fits all, you know, they're very customized. Yeah. Um, and so that's why those term sheets are very focused. And it does, it does take Mark and I some time to put together a term sheet because we need to get to understand the private lender that we're talking to and what their niche is. And then we craft our terms to fit their needs. Um so that's what we really like about what we do is it's 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 not a check the box kind of a a right. a, a, um, a risk profile. Um, it, it's very it's very very nuanced. So, so um, this bank within a bank is serving all the different all the different kind of sub industries within what I call the umbrella of private lending industry, right? So fixing all the business purpose residential sector, but also we have a lot of clients in the commercial bridge sector construction, that kind of stuff as well. So those are also clients, right? And those all fall under this bank within a bank. That's correct. So we've got, I think it's 60 credit facilities total in our portfolio nationwide. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably split about 50-50, wouldn't you say, Mark, between CRE bridge lenders and the SFR fix and flip? Yeah. And there's a small percentage of non-performing note buyers. uh, Oh, that's also part of you guys' kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. You know, Lisa hit on a key aspect though, that really is unique about what we do. And that, that, that is, we, we get up every morning and only as well as that whole team that she just mentioned. And all we do is focus on providing value to the private lender industry. So Mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, it's not like, Hey, we have this plus another portfolio. It's uh, it's, it's total attention focused on um, uh, you know, on those uh, business lines that we just mentioned. Okay. And what's what's fascinating to me is the, the level of flexibility granted, right? Because you know, I work I'm a much smaller bank, but like the the work the, the the philosophy internally was very, you know, command and control, very strict. The level of leeway you've been given to have effectively your own credit committee with your own guidelines. Now I'm guessing there's a little bit of kind of authority when it comes to like every every year here kind of the guidelines we want you to follow. But it yeah. sounds like you have a lot of kind of I guess operational control as to which way you're going with these people with these bonds. Yeah, we, I mean, we 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 do. We have policies. Uh, we do right. have a credit committee that's bank wide uh, that we do. You know, and it's tiered on on you know what we take in there as far as loan sizes go. But the inner workings of the bank do give us our division. Um, you know, there there's strong there is strong oversight, but we do have a lot of flexibility to. You know, within those with in those guardrails of the policies mm-hmm. to uh, uh, to accommodate our customers. Well, let's let's talk about the product specifically, because like what 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 in today's marketplace the the there have now become a variety of different types of what I call credit facilities, right? Revolving facilities available to lenders and both you know uh, small and large, right? Can you guys describe the primary product that you're offering, um, lender finance product that you're offering to the industry? Because I think there's been a lot of, I guess, misunderstandings, right? And they get a lot of requests that are being made to you guys and they say, oh, that's not what we do. And I think you know, a good opportunity for us to clarify, like, clear, like give clear explanations as to what Western Alliance's 
a lender financed product is for the private lender lending, lending industry. I, I can jump in on the initial on this one. Uh, the uh, you know we really looked at what our clients valued and and what they they valued is uh, is cash management because yeah. as they're growing a fund, what's happening is loans are they want to make loans they've got loans paying off and that's that asset management that that creates a cash flow problem for them sometimes or liquidity problems so. They um, or they have to sit on too much cash, and they have cash drag, which affects their negatively affects their uh, investor returns. Mm-hmm. So, you know, wh- wh- our, our product is primarily designed to, um, you know, mitigate those issues for cash cash drag and liquidity mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a secondary benefit that you know they they all like, and that's leverage. And um, so we give a reasonable amount of leverage. To the clients, that also helps, uh, you know, with their with their returns to their investors mm-hmm. on that. So, so primary cash management, secondary leverage, and um, and then you know that's it's really where. We but if, because there's so many different types of products, it is to be clear to the audience. This is a, this can this is a, meant to be a long term warehouse line product, right? We're not talking about these short term. No, ours is a yeah, yeah, and and ours is a line of credit. It's not an individual note on note for each individual property or each individual loan. We really benefit to lending to primarily funds and and, and sometimes, you know, family offices and private equity might have their own, uh, you know, closely held entities. But uh, the, and Lisa, tell me if I'm wrong, but most of ours are generally fund structures that will, um, aggregate their loans uh, under one entity and they look for a line of credit, uh, which is what we provide over a two-year term. Right. So yeah. balance sheet fund formation strategy is the primary account, which is why we share so many clients, right? Because for our audience who don't know, I'm not a professional podcaster. I'm actually an attorney <laughs> who writes funds for a living. So, <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, one of the things that we have, I want to stress on this product, and I've been telling, I tell this to my clients who are inquiring about this, is like, how does this differentiate from a lot of the products that we saw during I guess during, especially during COVID, that had a lot of volatility because you guys remain true with your clients. Actually, you guys grew during COVID. And so it's a non mark to market facility, correct? That's correct. Our credit facilities are committed lines. Committed lines. They're long term. They're not, there's no penalties for dwell time. Yeah, they're not a repo line. So, uh, exactly. so that's the big difference is a, it's, it's, it's not a repurchase agreement with the ability to can't, you know, that, that's how we grew a lot during. The pandemic was there were a number of now clients whose repo lines got frozen and they couldn't yeah. draw, and uh, and we offer that two year committed line that Lisa just mentioned and you know we do have limitations on our dwell time but we're talking two to three years right um, so yeah. from our perspective that's a that's like private <laughs> lending two years is a lot, is an eternity right so yeah it's a way longer I mean compared to what I meant by that yeah so that's so for a lot of the listeners out there like. They try to understand, differentiate, like which kind of line should I be pursuing? So let's talk about kind of, you mentioned it a little bit, Mark. Let's talk about kind of ideal candidate. So it sounds like a balance sheet lender, whether they sell loans to Wall Street or not, not a major concern, but it's not like they've got their own captive capital. They've got their own balance sheet. Ideally have a fund of some sort is the ideal candidate for you got, your, your guys' product. Um, but, I'm guess, but I'm sure as the private lending industries evolve, people have a variety of structures right <laughs> they have a variety of, and so like um leaders i want to talk about this, like, let's talk about kind of when when they come to you with a non-conforming structure like how do you guys manage that and how you guys talk them through that well we often refer them to you kevin so a lot of times you'll get a customer calling and say hey I, you know, i'm interested in the credit line you know and then you guys you guys have to go through the kind of the eligibility analysis with them, right? And so, like, let's talk about the eligibility and what you guys talk to them about and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I mean, we we talk about uh, preferably our counterparty is a, a formally organized debt fund organized under a PPM um, or publicly traded REIT um, or perhaps a, a sizable family office. Right. Um, and, and Mark and I. Uh, like to talk to prospects early on. So even if they haven't formed a fund yet and they're in the early stages, we like to to kind of set the expectations early of, of, of what we require as part of our application process when they are ready for a credit facility. So as Mark mentioned, debt funds, REITs, family offices, um, 
uh, most of our customers are balance sheet lenders. Some of them do sell some of their 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 paper. Um, <clears throat> and then we're, we're also looking, obviously, at the balance sheet um, in terms of um, uh, investor capital and, and leverage ratios. And I, ideally, we're looking for leverage ratios of, uh, you know, one to one, but but there is some flexibility based on the sophistication or institutional nature of the, the, the right. counterparty. Right. And, and, you know, even three years ago when you joined the team, Lisa and, and Mark, when you started, this industry has evolved massively, right? I mean, three years ago, oh man, it's like, it feels like an eternity, but you know, there's, there was a big transition. We talked about, we kind of touched on COVID. Like, let's talk about like how you guys uh, approached it and how you guys came out ahead after after that because you know you and I have talked privately on this issue but like I like I like to kind of talk about that because it was a very stressful time for a lot of us 2020, 2020 was I guess the uncertainty was the more scary part right um I remember Anthony and I talking about it, it was like we had to really contact our bankers to make sure we're not our clients aren't going to be in trouble because he had been scarred by that in the last recession so Talk about that real quick. I, it, it was a very, it's a very interesting story for you guys. How you guys came out of, how you guys attacked that crisis, and how you guys came out ahead afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it, it surprisingly, you know, to a lot of people, it was business as usual for us in our division. You know, obviously, um, Q two of twenty twenty, uh, we all hit the pause button for for new business. Um, kind of wait and see what happens. Um, but for our existing customers, it, it really was business as usual. And we were we were pleasantly surprised to see our customers pledging new collateral, collateral loans getting released as they received payoffs. Right. Um, we didn't, as we mentioned, we don't have any mark-to-market functionality. We didn't freeze any credit facilities. Um, I think we reduced one line, but that was at the request of the borrower. Um, and then about um, June or so, we opened up to to start taking new business. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe let Mark take it from here to kind of talk about the story for the second half of the year, because that's that's when it got really exciting for us. Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly right, Lisa. We, we um, kept very close to our clients, a lot of, you know, constant communication, just seeing how things were going and listening to them as, uh, you know, they actually... And that second half started getting even busier. And uh, and then, you know, we started fielding phone calls that word got out that we had continued to fund um, when, when, you know, sometimes others didn't. And uh, and so that led to, um, you know, in some cases, Lisa mentioned earlier that, you know, our sweet spot has historically been in that 20 million, maybe to 100 million range or so. And, and you know, a lot of times those companies with the institutional money center banks didn't what we wouldn't have been on their radar but then what happens is you have their investors now coming to them saying that you know we'd like you to have a committed line uh at least one and we got out how we had uh performed throughout the pandemic and so uh we got very very busy with uh, some much larger clients actually that um that maybe we hadn't done or worked with previously so yeah. and then from there it's just been a um a uh you know a a lot of activity uh, to date, to say the least. Yeah, I remember that that September, there were, we were getting phone calls from like sizable institutions that started. Hey, we we got you know, we got we started working with Western Lions, heard about you guys, and then also like the year after that, I had went to a, I think I went to like a a commercial real estate show, and there were sizable institutional groups that were working with you guys, and I was. And they were saying, yeah, you know, like you said, the biggest reason was they needed that committed line. And I think that rings true today. You know, what the reason why we've stayed busy on the fund formation side, even with all that glut of capital out there on the institutional side, has been the motivation to have that level of commitment and also to qualify for a committed line. You know, I think you got to have that kind of internal structure in place and infrastructure in place. Um, and I think that we've kind of cemented that as part of the blueprint of the industry, right? And so you see a lot of successful groups out there that are, you know, not institutionally backed, not proxies for institutions, right? Um, a lot of them have, a lot of them are um, banking with you guys and have a, you know, sizable or medium-sized fund or funds. And what I what I love about that is that the level of influence that has been made on the industry 
Um, but also kind of the habits in the industry, like you guys have become kind of a household name in the space. A lot of folks, you know, ask for introductions and meetings with you guys. But let's talk about your, your like the other people who are like starting to offer credit lines because you guys have influenced that, I feel like. And so let's talk about like how you guys compare to that and where how you guys uh, how are you guys managing that? Because the industry didn't have privately offered lines of credit before. Now it does. Yeah. Right? And, and before it, does. it might help before we jump there is just to note that, you know, having a committed line is that sound that that's important. But who's that committed line from? And, yeah. and what what is might be useful to know is that you know the bank was founded what 1994 ish, uh, and and in that time period we've grown to uh, the 26th or so top, uh, the top you know 50 we're in the top 50 largest banks in the country out of 5,000 some banks, so we're a you know we're a, we're rated investment grade by um, Moody's. Right. We're consistently ranked the number one bank in the country, or one or two number uh, bank in the country through S and P Global. So we've um, really built a a, a strong um, you know brand uh, of quality that can step up and provide you know the services that we're talking about. So you know, but I'll, at least I'll defer to you on the uh, you know on the co- competitive point right now. But I, I think that's part of it is just the brand. Well, it's a very impo- important yeah. point. Like the level of I guess acceptance and level of brand recognition that the bank has achieved over the past few years. And I think that it's kind of funny how like you know, in mortgage especially, there's m- money moves very fast in the space, and the disciplined folks who have been who have decided to pursue a committed strategy, both on their equity side and on the debt side for the business, have really grown immensely over the past two years now. I mean, there I, I can't name names, but there are all, a ton of our mutually shared clients. And a lot of them credit, you know, the the solutions that you guys have provided, um, along with, you know, the attractiveness of their investment to their retail investors. You know, over the years, it's become you know kind of what I call the blueprint, and you see funds out there and you know and privately held rates managing half a billion dollars now. Yeah, and you know it's, it's funny because when we got into the industry, we thought hundred million dollar fund was a massive fund. So, yeah, we all did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And at uncertain times, people want certainty, and uh, and that's uh, you know that just has been across the board. So uh, so yeah, Definitely so uncertain times still continue today, and I think that that. Yeah which is probably the, the people in your guys' direction because that certainty is important. That commitment is important. Committed capital is so important. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just like our debt funds, their borrowers expect speed and certainty of execution from them. Right. And the debt funds in turn expect speed and certainty of execution from us. And we right. really pride ourselves on that. And that's a big part to our competitive advantage mm-hmm. um, is that we try to be flexible and and fast. I mean, because mm-hmm. what's most important is that our customers have availability their availability to their their line right. quickly. Um, and so that's where that. I mean, Mark and I would be nothing without the team in Phoenix. You know, our 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 operations team and our credit team in Phoenix are critical to our success. And it's mm-hmm. just yeah. amazing what they can accomplish. Um, on a day-to-day basis. I mean, we're, we get draws out within minutes for our customers. And I want to tell a little quick. So the, what? you guys are very well known for your draw process. And I've had rating reviews from my clients we share. And um, I feel like it's kind of sets the standard. Talk about that real quick. So so if you have a client who's a borrower now, they're on, they're approved, they're funded. Talk about the draw process really quick. Because I want to make sure we highlight that. That's a really important feature. Yeah. So when our customers, you know, pledge new collateral loans to the to the credit facility, um, you know, we set up a share file, they upload the necessary documents, and typically same day or within 24 hours, that collateral is checked for eligibility and added to the borrowing base. Mm-hmm. Um, so an important distinction is we don't re-underwrite our customers' loans. Mm-hmm. Um, we check them for collateral eligibility based on the loan agreement mm-hmm. and add it to the to the um, the credit facility. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have eighteen thousand pieces of collateral in our entire book, so that's a, that's a lot of collateral that we manage on a day to day basis. Um, and then to take a draw, they simply send us an email and say, "Hey, we'd like to draw five million dollars off of our line." And typically, you know, we always say within an hour, um, those funds are in their 
account here at Western Alliance. Well, how about operations, Tim, I tell you. I mean, like, keeping up with those kind of email requests. I know you know how busy you guys are. And, yeah. And that's, and that's awesome. You know, that's all about kind of making sure we, our, our listeners understand if they were one of your borrowers, uh, when they when they pledge a piece of collateral, right, for a draw, there's no, is there a recording process with that or is it a, an unrecorded assignment? Uh, we do not record our assignments. We do okay. uh, collect uh, an assignment and an allonge as part of our collateral packages. And then we hold those assignments at the at the ready if we ever right. do, if we you run into to, an issue. You have to, yeah, yeah, we exactly. have to date, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe we've ever recorded an assignment. No, I, I, I don't either. And, um, you know... And that's part of the, the the value proposition of that speed that Lisa, Lisa also mentioned is I have one I was on one meeting and, and they said, you know, we actually time you guys and the fastest we were able to get funded was seven minutes. So, uh, so, you know, and when early on, when we started closing loans, I remember customers and Kevin, you brought this up when I first met you and said, what a difficult time it's, ten, you know, it is sometimes to get approved for a credit uh, or for a line in the industry. And, you know, but customers have came back to me after getting approved and said, you were right. I cannot, be- where have you guys been? Your funding process is right. so efficient. I've, I've never seen anything like it. So that's, that's, that really is the key to our. Yeah. And the operational efficiency. I mean, one of the things I, I like to talk about is not just about, it's not just about like, you know, getting through the door. It's, it's after that, the level of execution that needs to come with it is, is so important. And in today's marketplace, I want to talk about the competition, but like there's a lot of, lines out there and we're starting to see a trend toward um you know recording pledges and so and i've always found that to be kind of questionable because like legally speaking yeah i, I can probably talk to that a little bit um yeah. just I, I also do a little bit on the traditional mortgage side and uh and those repo lines and um it, it, what i what i found is that the repo lenders, including us on our, you know, on our um, Fannie Freddie type business, when the bank's buying a note under a repurchase agreement, it needs that note to be recorded, right? Sure. Because it's, it's, it, that's the difference from it being assigned, where we take an assignment, we're not right. recording it. So, so by not having a repurchase agreement, but actually having a traditional asset based line of credit, we are, not we do not need to go through that process of recording. Right. Uh, and it makes it just much easier to take collateral off the line and put collateral on the line. And you know, that's a hundred percent, right? Because the idea here is that we're we're translating a product that's wide, been widely used in commercial in commercial real estate finance, commercial commercial mortgage for you know, decades, and we're translating that to effectively a commercial purpose residential transaction. And it's different. It's from I, I'm guessing from the bank's perspective, it's a commercial transaction. It, it doesn't look consumer. We're not buying the paper. So there's less, there's less need for it. And that's been the rationale from my perspective as well. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. Nadell is a proud sponsor of Lender Lounge. Nadell helps connect companies to end users through branded items, custom items, and creative solutions. They have collaborated with established, globally known enterprises and the most exciting up and coming companies to create unparalleled branded experiences. With attention to the smallest details, Nadell helps you pursue your biggest goals. Their founder, Jack Nadell, first began creating branded merchandise in Culver City, California in 1953. With Nadell, products and experiences are transformed into memorable brand moments. For some, that means providing something immediately useful, like the perfect notepad or eco-friendly water bottle. For others, it's more intangible. They're creating something of sentimental value to take your breath away. Whatever you're looking for, Nadell can make it happen. Perfect for trade show giveaways, new hire gifts, awards, and more. For inquiries, please reach out to Ben Goldberg at ben.goldberg at nadel.com. So, I mean, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about is kind of, you know, your guys' involvement and, 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 and experience in the space as a whole, in the marketplace as a whole. You know, you guys go to events. We see you guys at uh, various industry conferences. But one of the things that's recent developments, I guess like about a year and a half now, year now, is a kind of um, I don't know what to call it. I guess it's a, it's a it's an, an organization in his own in his own right, and it's called Women in Private Lending. And we have one of the founding members here, Lisa. And I remember was it a year or maybe two years ago we were at a conference talking about the idea. 
And not lo and lo, behold, lo, today they're having their own networking events, and they're having a webinar. I think they already sort of had that webinar, right? So, or yeah, so but, it was actually at um, the Jurassi Captivate Conference last year. Um, mm. Christina Sawyer with Arixa and Carrie Geddes um, with with Bayport. We were all talking at dinner one night and said, "Hey, we." Let's let's create a networking group for for the women in the private lending industry, um, and just create a community where people can share ideas, and it can be you know just general networking, um, a place for career opportunities, what what whatever. Um, honestly, I I just thought it would be casual get-togethers, you know, at, at, at you know a lobby bar at the hotel of the conference. Mm-hmm. But um, we got a group of of ladies together and. Um, uh, it's amazing what's what's happened in a short period of time. We have a website, mm-hmm. uh, womeninprivatelending.com. We've had um, three uh, events to date uh, associated with conferences. Uh, we have a webinar coming up on June 29th. Yes. Um, so, um, well, by the time this airs, it'll, be ha- it'll have happened already. So oh, that's true. That's true. That's right. Well, um, and you'll have also have had another networking event. Right? Yes, at the, at the Captivate <laughs> conference. Yep, we'll have an event there, and then we'll also be having a conf- uh, uh, event at the AAPL conference uh, later right. this fall. Yeah, and I love the idea because you know one of the things that uh, yeah, as I've been in this space now since thirteen, and and over the years, I mean. Unfortunately, mortgage and real estate is still a very male-driven uh, industry, but private lending is a very diverse space, um, and there has it has become a much more um, diverse, or I, I guess, industry at large. And we see more and more um, women CEOs, women industry leaders, and I and I was so happy to hear that this was created. And when you know Ruby and our, and our on our team got behind it and started helping with the uh, or, you know, event event direction, I was expecting it to be kind of what you what you talk about, right? You know, anything that anything that kind of initiates like that, kind of slow start, because at the end of the day, a lot of folks uh, have trouble sending their people out for stuff like that, right? Like they don't want to, they have employees in the office, they don't want us, but we. I mean, the first iteration of it was a wild success. And today, now you guys are adding um, different initiatives for mentorship and, and, and education amongst yourself, amongst your working group. And there's no membership, right? You just participate. And so yeah. um, and talk yeah. about where you guys are headed now. What, what's what's on the docket for the Women in Private Lending kind of networking group? And what are you guys, what are you guys excited about for the coming year? Yeah, you know, I mean... Um, it, it, it's going to be a lot of networking. We're going to try to have also regional um, um, networking opportunities and, and meetups because not all uh, women in the industry get the opportunity to go to conferences. Right. So it might be a casual get together in Los Angeles or one in Orange County. We have um, folks on the East Coast so that we'd like to see it branch out into regional groups as well. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right, Kevin. I mean, the intent of this group is to create a, a community where um women, young women, experienced veterans are coming to events and they they have a group of familiar faces that they can network with um, and, and make connections. And um, I think mentorship also will be a big focus um, going forward. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see where the group goes. This group of of ladies, they're amazing. It's um, the the marketing team at Jurassic has been unbelievable um, with helping us get the website up and going and coordinating events. Um, and so it's been it's been very fast paced and very exciting. That's very cool, and I and I love to see that kind of like you know beyond you know, one of the things that we really kind of push when we're doing events or we're you know doing panels or whatever is t- telling our listeners and audience get involved in the space because that's how you can grow your business too right you don't just grow by getting deals done if you get involved with and 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 start building that work network and that you know kind of group of friends i guess you can call it you start growing and uh, let me ask you the let me ask you guys this like uh, uh, in your over the years you know when you with banks Banks don't typically go to a lot of our conferences. We don't see a lot of banks get involved. You guys got really involved. We're, we see it at every APL. We see it at all of our events. We see it at all, a lot of the local shows. 
you know, what, talk about like the, the motivation behind that, because it is not it's not very common. Right. We don't see a lot of banks at these shows. Yeah. A lot of banks come to the industry because, frankly, you know, this is kind of the anti bank industry. right? So yeah. but we do need the product and it's a very popular product. But like even then, we don't see a lot of uh, other banks who have this product, you know, show up a lot. And so I'd like to understand kind of how you guys view the industry as, as professionals yourselves and what it is that you're getting out of it. Early on, um, the you know, I, I I honestly just did a web search. Uh, you know, as a second person that joined the team, or third person, I should say, that joined the note financing team, and uh, you know, came on board to grow the business and started looking at. You know, I found AAPL online, reached nice. out. I actually cold called you, I think, uh, and just asked if uh, it, it was um, yeah, your team, and just started talking with you guys on different things in the industry and what to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that led to, you know, starting to attend, you know, then you guys started doing more of your own conferences. And, uh, and then that led up to, let's say uh, a couple of years ago when Lisa, Lisa joined and now I just do, she says, go to this. And I end up going, going to that. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's, we, we do, we made it, we, we've been very successful at, at um, you know, attending uh, select conferences that just makes, makes sense. Mm-hmm. And participating go ahead, Lisa, like, like yeah. we've had you guys on panels before, like it's not, very common for us to see that with banks. It's, you know, I, I, it's for me, at least my experience has been. And when I was at a bank, they, it was unheard of for one of the bankers to get on a panel. And like, um, I guess that comes with the bank's entrepreneurial spirit, like a little bit more flexibility that way. Um, the yeah. bank's really supportive of our, you know, marketing efforts and our participation in industry industry conferences. And, you know, I think it's part of the job that Mark and I enjoy the most. You know, we right. get to see a bunch of our customers in one place and and meet new people. Um, right. So, so we really enjoy attending the conferences. Okay. Well, I, I like to kind of transition to a part of the show where we kind of get a little bit of our crystal balls out because... It's a little bit of a weird time right now. And right now, for our audience listening, right, it's going to air in August. It's June right now. Um, we're in a little bit of a weird time right now. And, you know, for relevant to your product that you're offering to the industry, LIBOR is no longer adopted. LIBOR is, LIBOR is now no longer used. Indexes have changed. I've, oh my, I mean, I've seen every index known to man except for Wall Street Prime being used <laughs> in various term sheets. I'd like to ask first of all, I'll open this question with you guys. Are you guys using any particular index now that, li- that LIBOR is dead? Or are you, st- are you sticking with LIBOR? Some folks have chose to do that. Are you going to Prime? What are you guys doing? Yeah. So uh, so, so we started out with, with switching over to Ameribor, Bisbee, Prime, or Sofer. So we, we didn't know. It's kind of like the VHS. You, you, you had to figure out what product was going to go right. where. And, uh, and, you know, over the last year... I've seen more consolidation around SOFR with our commercial clients. So, uh, so those that do more, more commercial bridge lending, it's it's more SOFR prime based. And on the residential side, um, SOFR and Ameribor. And well, so those are, it's pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much, you know, today Ameribor and SOFR, although I would say from what I'm seeing is is more consolidation around SOFR. So that, that may be I, where... Things ultimately end up as a replacement. I prefer so for myself. I think it's a more reliable index. Um, but let's talk about kind of that. That leads to the next question. Is so kind of um. There's a lot of volatility on rates right now. Everyone's concerned about it. The only topic we talk about, um, aside from you know all the challenges come from DSCR. How have you guys uh, reacted the past six past six eight six seven months now? With all this volatility with your with your with your counterparties and your borrowers, because I'm sure they're coming to you concerned. Like. Uh, do we have to be worried? You know that kind of stuff. Um, what are you guys? What are you guys doing to kind of stem that tide? And uh, what are you guys going to be doing going forward? Western Alliance Bank, we were we're pretty consistent, and and mm-hmm. that's um, it, it translates to that certainty of execution again, right? We keep going back to that, but you know during the the the. the financial crisis um, back in 2008, Western Alliance Bank was one of the few banks still lending. Mm. And so we we pretty much stay the course. Like you said, we're very disciplined um, when it comes to, to risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were kind of steady Eddie. So mm-hmm. through um, good times, through tough times, it's 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 very consistent at the bank. Well, has there been a lot of calls to you guys about concerns? I mean, I, I don't even know. I'm not actually guessing. Have you guys gotten a lot of the que- like questions? Because 
some of my clients that we share have said, yeah, we're, we're going to be fine. But other clients, they haven't really indicated. And I just know that in general, the industry is kind of murmuring about, you know, volatility. And yeah. There, there you was know, rate shock. Oh, go ahead. There was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Not on us, customers. Yeah. Sorry, Lisa. I find the conversation is different depending upon where the customer is located. Oh. So California, right? There's a ton of competition. Yeah. So uh, it's a little bit of a different conversation than perhaps, you know, groups in in the Mountain West area. Mm-hmm. So um, that's what's been most interesting to me is is where we're seeing the the yield compression. I find is is very geographically specific. And I, mm-hmm. you know, Mark, I'm not sure what he's seeing on the East Coast, but that's what I've seen here on the West Coast. Yeah, and and I think that's probably true. Well, that is true, um, but it's probably changing uh, on a go forward. Um, it, it, so, a couple things, not just geographic, but also what type of lending the client does. So, so some that originate and sell, uh, the, the, that that rate shock occurred when you know they were able to originate residential DSCR loans at three point seven five, and now they're yeah. originating them at six and a half. So, uh, so one of the things that we looked at in that market is, and, and I, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but we also buy DSCR paper selectively. And um, I, you know, used to go out and talk to clients about it, and they really didn't have interest because our product wasn't as aggressive as, as some of the other aggregators out there. So, um, but but with the change in the environment, a uh, number of those conversations were restarted, and we. Um, you know, we have uh, flow agreements with our with our clients. You know, specific to our clients that and and that fit the box that we look for, and so that's helped alleviate some of their um, you know their concerns in the secondary market or the the, the securitization markets that can be fickle. Um, and then from from a pricing, uh, you know, what's going on in the you know from the crystal ball side, you know, I think uh, you're going to see banking just kind of go back to what it was you know five three four five years ago where um, you know, b- banks have been flush with deposits. They've had to get money out the door. They just, there was quantitative easing. There was a lot more money circulating. Our, our you know, monetary policy is changing. There's going to be more quantitative tightening. There's rising interest rates. So they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll probably be a little bit of a slower push to get money out the door from banks in general. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, but from our perspective, that wouldn't be any concern from our clients because we, uh, you know, we really like the space and our, our, our you know, we have strong relationships and uh, maybe things you know slow down in the new originations a little bit, but our existing clients, we we really uh, yeah. And I've never seen you guys kind of rush to get money out the door when it comes to origination. Not us. No, we yeah, haven't. So. Yep. I mean, if anything, right now it's a kind of a challenge to keep up with all the requests, right? <laughs> all right. So I mean, one of the things we want to do when we're talking about um, crystal ball is kind of you know the industry, and at least you kind of touched on it a little bit is what you guys are seeing with your counterparties. And so you touched on it as well, Mark, is the DSCR had a lot of volatility. Let's let's look at you know kind of the second half of the year and going into twenty three is where you know how, how do you guys feel about the space and what kind of changes do you guys foresee coming? Because I'm, I'm I'm I have my own philosophy on this, but you know I could be mistaken. So I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts. You know, we're seeing consistently, and I expect this to probably continue for the remainder of the year, is our existing customers looking for increases to their lines of credit. Anymore. Um, yeah, because most of our customers are balance sheet lenders. Um, mm-hmm. So they have the, the the balance sheet to be able to hold all of their loans. Um, mm-hmm. And I think with some of the competition in the market diminishing, um, uh, they're able to increase their originations. Um, we're also seeing, or at least I'm seeing, uh, more ground up construction. Um, so we're getting more, there's more discussions around uh, being able to put ground up construction on our credit facilities and sublimits for those types of loans. So I'm expecting that to probably continue. Which makes sense. We've always been talking about, we're talking about inventory all the time. God is going about it, which means construction, right? So, yep. Mark, how are you? You know, there, I mean, everything I read still shows that even with rising interest rates, there's still a, um, a, a housing shortage or de- there's still strong demand. Uh, yeah. Days on market is still, you know, it's increasing, but uh, it's it's still pretty low relative to history. So mm-hmm. I would agree with Lisa. I think um, I'm, I'm getting the same thing. I'm getting a lot of requests for increases right now. I'm getting a, still a good pipeline of new business. Um, will that ultimately slow? Probably. It always does. But, right. um, you know, for the for the next six months, I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, strong demand. 
And I, and I think that's a product. It's kind of funny. It's an inverse product of industry at large due to the institutionalization in the sense that Wall Street has to tighten. They're going to have to because they have less money. If that happens and the costs are going up, if Wall Street has to tighten, the, I guess you'd call it institutional proxies, institutionally backed companies out there that are aggregating and the, the pricing model changes and it incentivizes a balance sheet strategy incentivize and gives a, a lot of more opportunity to folks who are, are just originating to broker now to balance sheet lenders, but also creates opportunity for borrowers to go in that direction as well, because they're not getting the prices that they used to from these high volume, you know, originate and originate to sell model lenders. Um, and that, I mean, that's my kind of, it's a, it's a yeah, weird yeah, balancing I, act because it, I, I, it's large industry at large. It may cause some tightening, but for the sub part of the industry that has, that is a debt fund, that is a balance sheet lender strategy, they'll benefit from it, I think. So will they benefit from banks? Uh, you know, keep in mind what I mentioned earlier about deposits. If those become harder for banks to maintain, they're not going to lend as much. So you're going to, you may very well see more demand for private lending. That is true. Yeah. yeah. And because we yeah. started seeing banks jump into, I mean, everyone talks about, you know, the PacWest acquisition of Civic, but they're not the only one that were involved in the industry. I met a lot of builders who were saying they're borrowing directly from banks now. Yeah, smaller they're banks. Yeah. Professional flippers who are borrowing from banks now. I'm like, okay, that's probably going to change in the next you know, six to eight months uh, as the, the banks have to kind of reconsider their their uh, risk. And and, they're, and the most likely when you have that kind of philosophy change, you also start seeing a little bit of increase in OCC audit. So <laughs> those questions start coming and they get start getting a little more tight on the inspections on the file. So I think you'll probably start seeing some uh, some change in, in policy when it comes to um, some of that, some of the banks that have been effectively my clients competitors and that's been fascinating in in a lot of ways yeah yeah um, and i think you know some of the conversations i'm having with some of my cre bridge lenders is they're already starting to see the benefits of i think some banks are starting to tighten up a little bit on the yeah. cre side and so they're they're starting to see very bank like loan packages come in right um you know lower loan to value higher credit profile um so they're they're already starting to see the benefit of um i've already been tightening. hearing the same thing i'm hearing a lot of complaints about you know oh well they used to they approved this exact same loan six months ago yeah that's not six months ago <laughs> so <laughs> i can understand i used to, i did the same thing all right well one of the things we want to do as a, as a last part of the show and we're kind of running out of time but we have what we call the rapid fire round and now we have two guests so i want to make sure we cover so this is more about the, the industry get to know you guys a little better um, and uh, find out a little bit uh, a little bit about you guys beyond just the profession, right? So the first question I want to ask you guys is what is the business tool that you cannot live without? What is the one business tool that you cannot live without? For me, it's it's a uh, it's the yellow notepad. But how about you guys? I'm a notepad girl too, Kevin. I, I'm a list maker, so I, I'm old school. I, I write my lists out every day on a notepad. Use a notepad. All right. <laughs> yep. Mark, how about you? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the same exact thing, including hard book cover, uh, regular books, but uh, I won't answer the same as you guys. Mine would be my cell phone. And the only reason that is, is because I work remote and I need that, uh, that phone is, you know, always between text and calling. Right. I'm, a, I'm an old school guy there where it's mostly phone calls. So, uh, you know, it's, that comes in pretty handy. It's a lifeline. You need that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So a kind of a different type of question. What was your very first job? Very, very first job. I'll tell you, my first job was being a loan officer at a bank. <laughs> my, <laughs> my first real job. My first job was doing... I was a cashier at my mom's Hallmark store, so <laughs> that's my first job. <laughs> uh, outside of working for uh, the family business, I was uh, it was a newspaper route. Newspaper route, old school. I like that. Yeah, you don't hear about those anymore. Yeah, so my first job, like in high school, I was I was a nanny, but uh, my first real job was I was a credit analyst at a bank. So you've been in banking. You I've left. been. I was a finance right. major and went straight into to banking. Yeah. Nice, nice. All right, so. If, if you weren't where you currently are career-wise in banking, right, being cool in the lender finance side, what would you be doing instead? And we've had a lot of interesting uh, answers here. So, you know, what would you guys be doing instead for a career? I'd be fishing. Fishing. 
<laughs> You'd be a fisherman. <laughs> I'd be outdoors doing something outside. I don't nice. Know. <laughs> I didn't know that about you. That's cool. Is it you, got, you, you prefer freshwater or, or freshwater? Or yeah. Freshwater fishing. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Lisa? Uh, I think I would um, probably be like a travel journalist, like work for Condé Nast and oh, travel the world and, yeah. and review luxury hotels. <laughs> oh, man, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of the questions we want to we want to ask is when you're not out there doing, you know, uh, banking things and dominating the lender finance world and all those cool things. What do you guys do for fun? And I'm guessing it's fishing, Mark. <laughs> <Or> is <something laughs> else? Well, you know, it's funny. One of our analysts actually said, you know, isn't it neat? But the difference between Mark and Lisa is her clients are taking her out to these nice, nice restaurants and Mark's clients are sending them crabs and stuff for, for uh for out from uh, going fishing, so we we do have a little bit maybe of a different client base, but uh, but um, overall, you, you know, I'm I mean, an outdoors guy. Uh, that's that's I like to be outside, whether that's exercise, um, you know, whatever it is, just being hiking, out, fishing, hiking, camping. fishing. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Lisa, I'm guessing hiking, fishing, camping is not it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind hiking. You know, in Los Angeles. Oh, uh, you never know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love to travel um, and I love live music. Um, okay. I'm a huge Dave Matthews band fan. So right. I travel around and, and go to go to see his shows. So fantastic. Right. Yeah. And that's why I love the show. We get to learn these, learn these things about you. All right, guys. Well, I think that's all the time we have for the show. I really want to thank you guys for joining us. You know, we never get to we've been talking about doing this for a long time. And I'm really glad you guys found the time to join us um, for our listeners. Uh, this will be airing in about August uh, for season three. And once again, you know, if you guys are, if the listeners, if you guys are in the, in, in the industry and you're and you're thinking about expanding your business, you know, Western Alliance is a really good place to think to talk about in general, growing that business. And it, it, I couldn't, um, you know, stress highly enough. Like getting started with these guys early is going to benefit you regardless, even if you do end up working with them or not. Uh, and uh, look for them at the next conference. We'll, we'll see you guys there. Absolutely. Thank you so All much, right. Kevin. We really appreciate the partnership. Thank you oh, for having us. Thanks, Kevin. We love working with you guys. And it's been a great uh, year so far. And we're looking forward to many more years to come. And for our listeners out there, uh, this is Kevin Kim for Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim signing off. Thanks for listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did enjoy, please leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform and be sure to follow our show to be notified of new episodes. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe for more content from all of us here at Jirasi. Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim is available on all podcast platforms. Referrals really help us spread the word, so please send this over to someone you think might enjoy it. See you next time. This is Kevin Kim signing off.